Well, let's uh, bring you some more now on our top story this hour. This is the cases of uh, Alexander Koti and El Shafi El Sheikh, uh, two of the men who were involved, it is said, in the uh, cell of the group that calls itself Islamic State, which was executing hostages held by IS. Um, we've had a statement from the uh, government here about the suggestion that uh, they have been stripped of their citizenship. Now, that's their complaint. And the Foreign Office is saying it doesn't comment on individual cases, but it is working closely, it says, with partners to ensure that justice is served. We continue to work extremely closely with the US government on this issue, sharing our views, as we do on a range of national security issues and in the context of our joint determination to tackle international terrorism and combat violent extremism. Well, let's talk now to Carl Orton, who's in our Liverpool studio. He's an independent researcher on terrorism and the Syrian war. Uh, Carl, thanks very much for being with us on BBC News. No great surprise in that statement uh, from the British government, but there is to say the least, some ambiguity about what would happen to these men, uh, given that they are apparently now stateless. Yes, they, I think the ambiguity is obviously partly willed, but it's not entirely clear with the two gentlemen that they have both been stripped of citizenship, because Cody would have alternate citizenship, uh, El Sheikh wouldn't, and you, governments can't strip citizenship if it would leave people stateless. And so there's a... Within the two of them, there's unclarity about whether it applies to so, both of them. So what you're saying is that Koti, because he's also a citizen of another country, uh, he, he has a fallback, whereas... Uh, so Britain could strip it, but he'd still be a citizen of that other country, and, and that, that's not the case with El Shafi El Sheikh. Yes, it would be unusual if we've stripped citizenship from El Shafi El Sheikh, but they are both wanted men by the United States. They're both on their sanctions list of wanted international terrorists. And they've both committed crimes against the citizens of other countries as well, uh, including Japan and actually Syria, as it happens. So it would be very unusual to hand over to, to Assad's government. So there are a number of ways this could go. And obviously there is the political problem, which is hardly any of the countries w whose citizens went to join the Islamic State want to take them back. They'd prefer that they would stay abroad and not pose a security challenge internally. Nonetheless, presumably, they, they would like to see them put on trial. I mean, there are very straightforward arguments about if they've committed a crime, they should be prosecuted. But also, in sense, the symbolism of it would be quite important, presumably, for countries, including this one. I definitely think so. And it's not... I mean, the two men have said that they wouldn't get a fair trial which is nonsense. They would be able to have all of the evidence checked and everything else. And there are witnesses to what they did. They have sent videos of themselves to their families about where they are and what they've done. There are these kinds of things that can be processed. It would be very symbolic to have them tried, especially if it was tried at some kind of international tribunal. Uh, but there is the... I think there's a sense from some people that you're concentrating guilt on a, a small number of people, and a lot of people are going to get away with having done a lot of very bad things. But yes, you're right, the symbolism of doing it would be, would be very useful. And given that the, there has been a relatively successful process with cases like Rwanda and particularly in the, the case of the former Yugoslavia, do you think there is appetite for some kind of international uh, kind of judicial process to deal with Islamic State? It's very difficult to tell. I think internationally there aren't the blocks that say... I mean, the Syrian government has committed crimes against humanity and war crimes on a scale far above anything the Islamic State could even contemplate. But it will not face international justice because the Russian and Chinese veto applies to the United Nations. The Islamic State doesn't have that kind of protection, so there's not the kind of political barrier to doing this that there is with certain states and other actors. Um, it's just a question of whether there are, I mean, whether there are enough people to try. Uh, a lot of these people tend to get killed on the battlefield, and so there may be an argument about that. But yes, there may be some... It's also a problem with the former Yugoslavia's tribunal, that it did grind on for nearly two decades, and the number of prosecutions it actually carried out and successfully was fairly minimal. You're right that the Rwanda one was a bit more successful, but that ended up with a lot of people who essentially were forgiven and then given amnesty for what they'd done. So the, the record of international justice is, to put it mildly, very mixed. Carl Orton, independent researcher on terrorism and on the Syrian war, thanks very much for being with us from our Thank Liverpool you. studio.